Hello friends, I'm Kayla. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're here for the first time. I today am going to be reading books by authors that I've given five stars before. This video idea originally kicked off because I was looking for an excuse to vlog about Icarus uh, by Kay Ingram. I don't read a lot of YA these days, but some of my all-time favorites have been The Weight of the Stars and The Wicker King, which are these very like heavy, dramatic, soft high school stories where teens are going through really heavy stuff and finding like love and meaning along the way. So Icarus is her latest and I'm just excited to give this a go and see how it goes. I'm not going to call this video five star predictions because if I were to actually predict the rating of this I would say probably a four just because it's not an age range that I feel really connected to anymore but I have to read this. And then I figured since I'm reading a new release, let's make it a whole new release video. This was sent to me early by the publisher. I had a pre-order of it, but it was kindly offered to me. It's Goddess of the River by Vishnavi Patel. I gave Kaikei five stars last year and I'm just really excited to pick up something from her again. But then I was like, okay, yes, Hanif Abdurraqib has a new release for 2024 and I do wanna read it, but I should probably go back and read this one first uh, this is his first, I believe. They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us. This was my favorite nonfiction of last year. This is another collection of essays and I just think it's gonna be great. So now it's not a new release vlog and also I need a fourth book, but now I have way too many options and things to pull from. I could read another Mbolo Mbui. I could read another Eric LaRocca. I could read more short stories from Josh Mallerman. I could read a Christina Henry. I could read the latest Nevo. I don't know after those three that I've committed to where I'm gonna go with this video. I think I'm just gonna pick one more, but it's whatever I'm in the mood for in the moment. Short stories, intense fiction, horror, fantasy. It depends what the other books give me and what I am in need of. So of course, to kick it off, we're gonna get into Icarus. I read the first couple chapters of this and you can definitely tell it is written by the same author. There's just this distinct style. And I agree with Olivia A. Cole on the back who calls her books rhythmic and moody, a book of aching. Kate Ingram tells a story you can't get out of your skin. Now, there is a reason that I am hesitant about this because I've picked up a couple books about heists and don't like them. I don't like reading from the perspective of a character who's trying to pull off this grand scheme, who is being raised in an environment where they are to take advantage of people and they're using their skill set, even if it's in a positive way, to like accomplish goals. I just don't really like the conniving, manipulative type of tone that those books have, even if they have like a good message. Um, this one, he definitely is not interested in being a part of this experience, but he feels obligated to because it's what his father is doing. So Icarus is raised in a household uh, just with his father and his father is like an art dealer, an art forgery, an art thievery um, in individual. And he is breaking into this one person's house repeatedly, I guess just like this rich person in town who has a lot of art and they are sneaking in, they're replicating the artwork, replacing it, and then selling the actual stuff to whoever out on the dark web, the black market, the, I don't know, sometimes it's going to like museums. And it has the tone of this abusive dynamic Icarus. This is all he's ever known. And because this is his life, but he's still going to school, his father's very controlling over who he's allowed to talk to and what kind of life he's leading. No one's allowed over to his house, obviously, with all of this stuff going on. So he's been very isolated. And what's going to happen is He's going into the house and there's a guy there, his same age, I believe, Helios, who lives in this mansion or has, who's just moved into this mansion and he's gonna go to steal something and there's another person there, but they're going to fall for each other. I'm already really enjoying it just because this author's writing is definitely for me. But I could see how, I've seen other people uh, critique her books and say that like, this doesn't feel like high school, this doesn't feel like te real teenagers, this isn't how people talk. And I get that. But in my mind, these books exist as a kind of uh, representation of how it feels to be a teenager, where everything is happening to you for the first time and therefore it feels 
so dramatic. It, everything feels world ending. Your first love, your first whatever is the biggest deal. And so it is very over the top and soap opera. Grand declarations like very early and big sweeping like stunning quotes that's like would a 16 year old really speak this way there's just something about it that really really works for me and i'm probably gonna fly through this today so i'll check in with you again at a uh, halfway point i am enjoying icarus exactly as much as i expected to as much as can be expected she writes appropriately for her teen audience and I can only wish that I was a teen reading it if I had her books when I was in high school like I could have enjoyed them even more and greedy me really would like her to write some adult books because there's nothing in her prose or plot or character building or dialogue or anything that leads me to believe she couldn't or shouldn't this is a love story between these two characters but it's also just more so Icarus's story figuring out what he wants out of life, you know, traditional things, even though he has a very untraditional life. He's making friends for the first time and he's feeling seen by people and everyone who's gone to school with him all of these years finally gets to connect with him the way that they've wanted because he's kind of this enigma. Helios's father is terrifying. So he absolutely cannot get caught in this house, but he feels drawn to it. And because of what Helios is going through, Icarus is trying to support him in the same way that he's feeling supported for the first time by people. And I'm sure everything's gonna turn out well in the end, but it does feel very stressful. It's all very far-fetched as I would expect um, with this type of author. Um, it's like so strange, the idea that there's no cameras in the house that'll catch them and he can break in at any time and be with Helios without being caught. Besides the fact that things are just being regularly stolen like from his house though there's the idea that he kind of knows about it I guess and there's like this family rivalry saga going on behind the scenes. I'm gonna finish it up and give you my final rating which is probably gonna be a four if not a 3.75. A 3.75 is indeed where I'm landing. That's more me than the book. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Happy to have read it. It's nice going into authors' books that you've given five stars before because even if I'm not going to love it, like I can't consider Kate Ingram an all-time favorite author yet because I have to give an author three five stars for that to happen. And I just checked her website and it does say she's like loosely working on a five book adult series which is very intriguing to me. I hope we get to see that one day, but it's just like getting back into an author's work that you've loved before, that feeling of familiarity and it's like comfortable. It's all just such a nice time. Her books always really well balance hope and heartbreak. I don't know if that's the right word, but just like there's they're so sad and they're so melancholy and I, I both times I read her books before I said that at the end I felt like I could cry like there was just this heavy feeling that isn't sob worthy but it just it's weighing really heavily on me as a reader the other ones did that more so this one I can definitely still feel that and I think it'll do it for other people but then there's also just this like love and support and joy that is threaded through all of her books it was sad but it was a great journey for these characters and I enjoyed myself would recommend if you are reading YA these days and liking the ones that are heavy and hope filled. Um, next, I'm gonna get into an essay collection. So I'll let you know when I've read the first, or I know I already read the first one because I was reading the first chapter of things. And that's what made me put this, put this book on hold was because the first one was so good. And I didn't think having two five-star Hanif Abdurraqib books in one year was reasonable. Like I had to put a pause. So now I'll get back into it. We are 10 kilometers into our bike ride today and I've been listening to the audiobook of They Can't Kill Us Till They Kill Us. I listened to the first story which is about Chance the Rapper a couple months ago and I gave it a five. 
And then the next one that I read was about like Carly Rae Jepsen, but like each story isn't about like a celebrity or a piece of art. It's about the conversation. Like there's a lot of conversations that come along with each one. I feel like these essays have been shorter than the ones I read in A Little Devil in America, but I'm liking them equally. They're all interesting and I'm having a good time. Just wanted to update you out here in nature. It's very pretty. This is me really committing to the color scheme of the video. We're doing blue. We're doing blue. I just went and got my nails done. I am feeling back to myself. I have not filmed in a week. I have not read anything. I haven't done anything. I have been having really bad allergies. I ended up in the ER. I still haven't figured out what the allergies are. Um, but today's the first day I put in contacts and put my makeup on. And underneath my makeup, there is a rash and I'm peeling and I'm on steroids and <laughs> it's been a rough time, but I need to get back to this video, back to being on camera. So here we are. For you, nothing has changed. For me, I looked like um, a beach ball for a while. I've also been having, so I just haven't been able to focus very well, but we're getting back to it. I am now halfway through this because I really like the audiobook. What's interesting about this is the audiobook was done like five years after the physical copy was published. And so Hanif Abdurraqib decided to insert some moments of commentary on his own stories, which is great for me because I love meta stuff like that. I love, if you're into movie commentary, like the actors speaking through the movie about what they thought of the movie and their performance, you would like this. If you also like essay collections and nonfiction and like things about media itself and performances, whatever. We're getting a lot of moments in his life of attending performances, attending concerts. He did like journalism, wrote for magazines and newspapers and attended a lot of live performance. And he talks about a lot of those experiences and how it connects to something in his life. Now, what I will say about this that I don't think it's as successful for me as Little Devil in America, though I can confirm that that was written with the intent of being a standalone collection. Like, I don't know if this also was a combination of things that already existed, but it didn't feel like it. This feels like it's a collection of things that already existed and isn't done with the intention of having a theme. So some of these essays, as you can see at the beginning, it lists them all and where they originally existed. And now it's a combination. And I think you can tell there are some that were inserted like as this was being written to kind of tie things together. But in general, it just feels like um, a combination, what's the word I'm looking for? A compilation, I guess, of greatest hits, if you will. We had one about Schoolboy Q, we had one about The Weeknd, I gave those five and four stars respectively, and just like the idea of sex symbols in music, how the author feels about love and passion and desire. There was one about Afropunk. The majority of these I've been giving four stars. I love essays written by poets, there's another four star. It just has, they all have beautiful language. They all have something that I've highlighted, but many of them are too short for me because it feels like they existed to be something else somewhere else. In the Follow Boy one, it was about him experiencing Follow Boy and the rise of that band and um, destruction that went on within it, but it also tied to the loss of one of Hanif's friends in real life, how it felt going to shows, how this loss affected him. It was a non-linear one as well, which was really successful. So that one was a five. It's easy to convince people that you're really okay if they don't have to hear what rattles you in the private silence of your own making. Like that's a stunning quote. And then just when I was like, okay, so I'm getting a grasp for what this is. It's mostly music performances and just the love of um, bands. Then it switched to Ric Flair and getting an essay about Ric Flair in the middle of this was such a surprise and I gave it a five. Like suddenly we're talking about WWE and like that is a performance in itself but it just like it's keeping things interesting for sure. So now that I'm back in my reading groove I'm gonna knock out the second half of this and tell you my final reading. It has once again been a couple days since I've seen you. Should I update you? I have just not been very skilled at vlogging taking you with me anywhere. This is not the most interesting vlog that I've, I will ever post. Um, I have since had a doctor's appointment. It was just a while wait. I know a lot of you 
were wanting me to go see my proper doctor and I have now and just as you all told me my allergies were going to continue to get worse as I waited for that appointment and that happened but now like I'm feeling great I'm still waiting for my allergist appointment um and hopefully we will get some answers from that but in the meantime my skin is clear <laughs> I'm feeling great I actually think my skin has never looked better I don't know if it was just because like everything peeled on my body but I feel fresh and and clean and um I also went and saw the game seven of Canucks Oilers which was a crazy experience and while we were in Vancouver I finished this and I started this so let's give you the number the number is officially a 4.5 perhaps if I had read this before the incredibleness of a little devil in America which for some reason I can't see on my shelves, but it's probably in a pile somewhere. I still have to unpack all of my luggage from the weekend. I have a lot to do today. So maybe I'll grab the audio book of this, but at this point I am a hundred pages in. I'm not talking about this yet. Okay, sorry. My, I'm still not like fully here. A little scatterbrained is what I would say. Yeah, perhaps if I had read this first, I could have given it a five, but because I know how good his essays can get and how intentional they can feel this felt not as like perfect i guess but it still had so many like great things to say what i came away with at the end when i said a lot of them were too short um, because they were created for something else to be a little piece of you know a magazine or something i even talked about it with this one well in my own notes uh the white wrapper joke is one of my favorites in here and even though it's one of the longest like it's that many pages, which is rare. It still felt censored. It felt like he was censoring himself. It felt like it could have been such a longer in-depth conversation and that he had to halt his ideas um, in order to make it like an easily digestible essay when I could have read an entire book just about this concept. Talking about the rise of Eminem and MGK and how people react differently to um, people in hip hop, who attends rap shows, who can attend, how they've become something different over the years and just like privilege and racism within the industry. It just a lot of his thoughts, but not enough, not enough. It didn't give me quite enough. Um, I think because I also just like assumed I'm the same age as this author, maybe I need to Google it. But I think that my enjoyment of this also has to do with the fact that I grew up in a completely different environment, completely different culture, but at the exact same time as this author, at least that's what it feels like. All of his thoughts, references, pop culture things are so relevant to my life. But I'll have to double check that. Maybe he's younger than me. Um, Johnny Cash, Never Shot a Man in Reno or The Migos, Nice Kids from the Suburbs. This one was another one of my favorites. They Will Speak Loudest of You After You're Gone is another five. The one about Serena Williams was so good, but too freaking short. This quote though, it's almost unfathomable to tell someone to act like they've been somewhere before when they're intensely aware of the fact that they were never supposed to be there in the first place, isn't it? Just really lands. Oh, and then also my first police stop was five. So the further I got into this, the better it got for sure. Just all of the best ones happened to be in the latter half. Um, February 26th, 2012 was also really good. I feel like everyone could kind of well, not everyone, but you know, people who were alive for it, obviously, um, can tell you like the story of where they were on 9-11 or finding out that Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, and like the thing about this one is you didn't know that, or like occasionally in here, essays will pull off a little like kind of surprise in that way. Like this, you didn't know that you were in that type of story. He was just telling a story of what he was doing on this day. And then it happened to end with, and that's the day that Trayvon Martin was murdered. And here's how it impacted my life. And he's really just so successful at how to build tension or distract you with something or be talking about three things at once. And you don't realize by the end what the intent of an essay was like, this is just so good. Also the one about Fleetwood Mac, a five. So overall, just mathematically, it has to be a 4.5, but I, and not but, I had a really great time with it. I think this is a fantastic collection and I'm even more excited to pick up this one. Even though it's about basketball, I don't care about basketball. I'm sure it's not actually about basketball. It's about 10 million other things. How old is this man? 
Okay, he's seven years older than me. Moving on. This is Goddess of the River by Vishnavi Patel. And I read the first 100 pages. It was uh, tough to get through just because of the content. Definitely recommend reading the content warnings. Um, I don't, like the thing about this is it's a retelling or a reimagining of a real story. The Mahabharata, sorry. Um, it's a story about philosophy, sin, and the meaning of life. So to read the content warnings is to like spoil what that original story, the story that it tells and how this takes the story and makes it what the author wanted it to be. So I don't want to spoil anything, but it's, I guess, worth mentioning that there is a lot of infanticide at the beginning of the story. And I thought it was going to be for like, I thought that was going to be the entire story. But at 100 pages in that has come that, that has ended, I guess. And now we're in part two, which is going to be a completely different situation, I guess. But in this first part, you're following the goddess of the river. And because of various things that have happened, um, she is responsible for these godlings. Is that what they were called? Godlings. They are mischievous. They live in the riverbanks with her. And because of things that happen, um, she gets cursed basically to live as a mortal and now she's living as a mortal and she's trying to like complete all of these things that she needs to do to free her godlings free herself and in that she needs to give birth as many times as godlings as she had to like return their souls to their bodies or however like however the book explains it. I'm paraphrasing. And she decides um it doesn't say it in the synopsis but I don't think that it's like a spoiler. I don't know. With the first 100 pages, like she's, she kills all of her babies. And then the actual story is going to be about the child that was birthed last. And I think we're going to follow him as he becomes like royalty because at, in her mortal life, she has to find somebody who um, will like kind of not question her on what she's doing with these babies. And she has to create a strategy. And at this point, um, the synopsis does say she is forced to leave her infant son behind and his story is going to be, I guess, becoming whatever he's meant to be. And much like Kekei, the experience of motherhood and being different or separated from your child and the dynamics that exist there. It is extremely well written. It took me a while to get into. It was heavy at the beginning. It's not too descriptive and it's not too sad. Um, obviously the topic is sad but the way that it's done and the reasons behind it like it's written in a way that has a necessary intent behind it and also the content warning tells you when those scenes are happening and they are brief and they are um few but it also says it's going to be like a thread in the entire book like obviously it's it's an important like moment in this grander story as well as the modern version that Vishnavi is telling us about Ganga. So I'm going to pop in the audiobook so I can get some things done around the house and get my life back in order because it is currently uh, the release day. And I'll check in with you after part two, which is the most significant portion of this. All right. I don't have the most exciting update ever. Well, it's exciting because look how far I've made it in. I'm actually 300 pages in of, let me check, these what are these edges called? Deckled edges? I'm really getting on my nerves. Um, 400 pages. Exactly. And the last two sections were good. They were, there, there was nothing wrong with them. They're just like basically about the goddesses experience being asked by people to help them. And she's just sharing her like journey of being the river and people coming and having their babies there and washing their hands there and and just like coming and and asking for things and she's always the center of so many people's lives and then every time somebody comes and asks her for something she has to kind of decide what she wants to do with that and how she wants to help that person so she will have these visions of what they've been through in their life and you get these little scenes and storytelling from various characters then seeing her kind of thought process 
as the goddess. I find it very interesting. There's this huge character map at the beginning that I thought would overwhelm me. Like, I know it's just for a reference, but sometimes when books kick off this way, I'm like, okay, this is one, gonna be one of those books where there's so many characters and I get so confused and I'm gonna flip here a million times and I have to remember all of these people. But it's really not like that. It doesn't really matter who's who in the moment. It's just, I'm along for the journey and it hasn't gotten confusing, which is great. I'm gonna wrap it up and then let you know in the morning my final thoughts and then pick one more book and then post the video. Me posting a video after like 10 days? Has it been more than 10 days? I think because I just watched um, Everything Everywhere All at Once with my members a couple days ago, I feel like I've been online, um, but no, it has indeed been 10 days. By the way, I am so annoyed I didn't watch that movie earlier like I am glad I waited because I got to watch it with people the besties and I do a movie night like every other um month I'm thinking about doing Blue Crush for July because sometimes it's fun to do nostalgic picks and sometimes it's fun to do newer stuff and everything everywhere all at once obviously like everybody loves it got so many awards and people tell me all the time that I'm gonna like it but I never really paid attention to what it was like what the pitch of it was and so I watched it and I went in completely unknowing of anything and it was the wildest time and I had such a good time watching it and yeah I'm just really glad that I did that anyway I am off to read and bed Liam participated in a robotics competition today and he got in the top um 16 of like 200 which is really fun in case you wanted a little update about him. <laughs> I posted a picture of my story because we were at a game and I just, I don't post him like ever. Um, and everyone was messaging me like, what the heck? How is he that tall? Why is he so tall? What happened? He's a giant. Anyway, I'll see you in the morning. I have finished Goddess of the River and I'm giving it four stars. I think that... I wouldn't have been able to tell you if this author's name wasn't on here that it was the same author. I think there are common themes for sure, but the writing style was just so different to me, which I think you could say is a really successful thing for this author um, to be pulling off character voices so successfully because this just felt like such a different style from Kaikei. It was more of like a fairy tale. It felt like, I don't know, much more reflective, I guess, and less of a clear plot. There was less happening in here. And it was more about like morality and people grappling with the power. Same with Kaikei. Kaikei was about like how she was going to use her power for good. And this was the same. It was about morality. It was challenging like, um, uh, like dedication to your family and who you wanted to help and who deserved help and a lot of making decisions and weighing the impact of the choices that you were going to make for various characters, not just the goddess herself. This is a lot about sacrifice and just considering many things. There was also kind of like battling a lot of war, um, who was in charge of this kingdom, who deserves to be in charge of the kingdom. It was to me super successful in what it set out to do. I just didn't feel the emotional impact that I did with Kaikei. So that's that, definitely recommend it. And now the last decision of the vlog is I think pretty clear that I need to go into horror territory. And what I was thinking is because I haven't had a five star story in this video, I've had five star essays, but I haven't had a story, a fiction, something that's like really impressed me in an imagination kind of way, I think I should read a short story collection because even if the whole thing isn't gonna be a five, at least one of the stories probably will be. And it's hard to choose between Eric LaRocca and Josh Mallerman because I've had different experiences spanning genres with both of them. But because this is out from the library and I do need to return it in like a week, I think, I think I should probably go with this one. There are only five stories in here and it's 375 pages. So those are definitely more novellas than short stories. And I've had success with Josh Mallerman novellas. So I'm just gonna update you after each one and hopefully one of them, I come on and I say, it was a five. The first one is called Half the House is Haunted 
which gives me hope because I'm still on a journey of finding my favorite haunted house story. And maybe this is it. Well, that first one was certainly not a five star. I don't know what it is, maybe like a three. Um, but the yogurt bowl that I just ate while I had it, definitely a five. I'm missing Vancouver's food. <laughs> Every morning we were there, we got acai bowls and they were so good. And then I also had Chipotle, which is what I have every time I go to Vancouver. I don't care if it's like simple and not real Mexican food or whatever. It's so good and it's better than every single place that we have where I live. Anyway, that first story was about a sibling duo who, oh my God, baseball practice is canceled again. <laughs> okay, it was about a sibling duo who like met up every, you know, like, well, we followed them at three different timelines, one where they were like six and eight years old and then 80 years old. And the boy was convinced that the girl was like scaring him and telling him that the house was haunted. And that's what the whole story was. I don't really love um, like creepy child stories and a third of it really felt like that. So it was not for me, but that's okay. Maybe the next one will be. Apparently it's pouring rain where his baseball practice is. So it has been bad weather since we got back and I feel like we brought Vancouver's rain with us, back with us. Anyway, next story is called Argyle. Cross your fingers for me. That story was a kind of murder confession. I guess I would call it that. Kind of the exploration of a broken mind. I didn't really care for it and I gave it a three. The next story is called Doug and Judy by the house washer, trademarked. I feel like maybe you weren't crossing your fingers and like you were just pretending for the last story. And I think that's really disrespectful. So for this one, actually cross your fingers. Go ahead, I'll wait. And now it'll be a five star. We're on the same page, okay? Thank you very much for your thoughts and your time because we got a five. That story was about a married couple a terrible married couple and uh, a house that cleans itself. They like buy a piece of technology that cleans the house and they get trapped by this here trapped by their possessions, their history and each other. Oh, it was delicious. It was so fucking weird, but it was mostly just about the dynamic between these two people. And that is something that I love. I love stories about a couple that isn't romance. Like just the depraved stuff that goes on in um, a relationship. I was very into it. And now I can peacefully move on with no pressure to the Jupiter drop. Well, a bit of a disappointing way to end the vlog. It was about like deep space travel as you would expect, but it was more about a guy like confronting his past. I'm giving it like a three, I guess. And then since that didn't go great, I was like, I'll just read the next story and get through it. And I'll come on with like one good review and one negative review. But then I DNF'd the last story. It was just boring. Um, it was about like triplets. One of them was killed and then the other two, the guy who killed the other one, didn't know he had two brothers who looked just like him. So then they were creating this scheme to like trick the guy get their revenge. Not really my kind of story. So at the end of the video, I ended up with a four and a half, a four, and then a couple of threes. So not uh, the most exciting situation to be in. As I drop it on the floor, glad I didn't buy it. I can return it to the library. There you have my little comeback vlog. Thanks for sticking with me and um, kindly waiting for me to feel well to come back and post something. I'm going to start filming another thing right away right now for my members because I'm doing a full spoiler review and vlog as I read A Dangerous Collaboration, the fourth book in the Veronica Speedwell series. And I've heard it gets juicy. So if you're a member, I'll see you over there. If you're not, my next video, what will it be? I've been working on my 1997 one for a while. I don't know. I don't know when I'll see you next, but it'll be sometime and I'll love to have you there.